Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Michael Koch from USDA. So I'm going to give a, a different kind of talk. I didn't even have this slideshow until yesterday I, as I watched, uh, watched these presentations and thought about why am I, why am I here? Antar, why am I here? Uh, let you know where soil moisture is and why we're, we're, uh, where we're going with relation to water, groundwater. And then kind of define some terms that would be useful because I, I hear a lot of people talk about models and, and data and more data and big data. And that's, uh, I have different definitions. Uh, than many people. So let's talk about it. Uh, National Groundwater Monitoring Network, I, I remember Matt gave the, a discussion yesterday where he said, well, we compared to the network data that was available, not all of them, not everything, a subset that was good, good data. We all say we want more data. I can get you a lot of data. Don't know if I can get you more good data. That's, that's a, a piece of trouble there. As well, how much good data do I need Really, especially if my decision is binary, yes or no. You know, do I do this or do I do that? Not, you know, how much water should I put onto my field uh, for irrigation purposes? That's, that's a very fine-tuned, high accuracy. You know, you need a low, a very good uh, certainty of your number. But if in the end you just make a decision, A or B, well, I just need to know that eventually my decision was right. So my uncertainty, I don't really care as long as my outcome's the good one in the end, which you only know when you're, when you're finished. So uh, building on what someone referred to today as the, uh, as the ACWI, uh, uh, the subcommittee on groundwater, there's also a sub, we're uh, following their pattern uh, for soil moisture. And this is what soil moisture looks like throughout the world. Uh, you notice there's a lot of green dots over the US. When it comes to developed worlds, uh, the US is the most heavily monitored soil moisture region in the world. Those red dots are false. Those are a, a long-term periodic data, data sampling in Russia that are no longer collected. So if you just take those out, uh, just imagine that you're only seeing the green dots. It's the US, and, and then the rest of the world are in a different category. So we're trying to zoom in on the US. We're trying to make uh, a database that would collect all of the in situ data in the US and put it all in one resource, just like groundwater. You'll see that we have lots of states outlined. We have really densely monitored states like Oklahoma, New York, Georgia. One of our challenges is these are all um, independently run state networks. They have to fund themselves, and to do that, they often charge for data, and we can't uh, afford that. And uh, so negotiating contracts so that they can help inform our decisions uh, with, regard, with regards to drought estimation uh, is really where we're heading right now. It's night, this is an initiative out of NIDIS, National Integrated Drought Information System. So we have this, this problem that we're trying to solve and we're following groundwater's lessons. But the, there are many different aspects of this and I don't want to go into you know, which sensor do we use, what's the spacing, how much data do we have, what, what data rate, but we're asking these questions and we're exploring them and this is our hard numbers. But in the end, this is for very specific numerical purposes. You know, ca satellite CalVal, groundwater monitoring, uh, surface flux estimation, these are all Science, easy science questions. Now you say easy, huh, this is science, this is hard. Well, it's, but it's numbers and you can eventually figure out the numbers, right? You can follow a pattern. And when you can't follow a pattern, that's where the challenge really starts. When you talk to a human interaction with these processes, that's where it gets fun. So one of the questions is how can we get more data? How can we get good data? So this is a, a cooperative observer program out of NOAA. Uh, this is their temperature equipment sites. There's about 4,000 of these. These are uh, citizens that are collecting data and sharing it with NOAA. And sometimes this is a month later. They're writing it down on a piece of paper. It's my, it's my mom. Uh, she's got maybe a white box, or she goes out, and every morning she writes down what temperature is at 6 a.m. or what time, every time she wakes up. Or there's a, uh, similarly, there's uh, catch gauges measuring how much, moisture, how much rain has come in, and they write that down. Maybe if they're lucky, they have a data logger that actually stores everything and they pull out that little SD card and they put it in the mail and they mail it off to the co-op uh, co facilitator in DC. And then they collate that data to make a climate record. This is what 4,000 stations looks like in the US. And you're all like, oh man, if I had 4,000 stations of groundwater, what would I do? What would you do if you had 10,000? 
What if you had 10,000 cooperators who are sending you their water use data? Now you're not getting all the data, but you're getting a person's data maybe on their well. And, and you believe that that person's data could be used, they're, and they're freely giving it to you uh, as a cooperator, telling you, this is how I and my local, my local municipality is using my, date, my water from my well. You know, you know, maybe I'm competing for you know, best cooperator that year. That's what they do with the co-op network. So this is one of those avenues of how can we get more data, but in a, in a manageable way. Because if I were to run this out of a central location, can you imagine how many millions and billions of dollars I would need to have this properly maintained? And I'm not getting great data. I'm getting my mom reading off that rain gauge. Or I'm getting my mom pulling out the SD card and shipping it off to me. So it's not always highly calibrated equipment, but it is information that's helping to inform my decisions in a qualitative way sometimes. And I have to be able to accept that. We're talking about water use. This is a shift. Don't, don't strain when I just quickly go away from uh, maps. Uh, this is what water use is currently. Uh, this comes out of uh, USGS. I pulled this up yesterday in groundwater.org. And irrigation, is, we all have this vision. What is irrigation? You know, what are we using irrigation for? It's, it's the drip, drips over my cornfield or my, my wheat field or uh, in the, the, the houses that have tomatoes or onions or something like that. So irrigation is a big part of this as well as public supply. And there are definitely efficiencies that can be earned in this. So maybe it's not just what is the water available, but how can we keep the water that we bring in that we pump out? Is there conservancy, uh, conservation efforts that could be targeted to improve this? Uh, and this is where the irrigation happens. This is current status, 2012, so seven years ago, um, from NASS. So this is, someone asked, where is the irrigation happening? Well, here's, here's a map of where it's happening, little blue dots. And this changes over time. It's not like everything's always in the same place. Here is where it's changing over, seven, over a five-year period. So you can see that it's moving out of the places that are now water challenged and going to places where they aren't. Uh, where there's more readily available water that's less difficult, it's, it's uh, less uh, challenging uh, legally to draw as much water as you want. And this is all online, and the data is available. Getting it into a resource that may be more useful would be interesting. And this is what it's using to grow. Now, one of the interesting things on here, and it took me a while, I never, I never found a, a reputable resource. I only had YouTube that would told me, tell me this one, but uh, this is all the, the cash crops, and, and the irrigation by cash crop for the different states. Uh, they divide east-west. And if you were to take corn and wheat together across the U.S., there is another crop on here that is not listed, that is more than corn and wheat added. And that's turf grass, lawns, golf courses, things like that. So there's a mysterious number out there that's not being tracked by agriculture necessarily, which is the usage of water uh, by... Uh, for public use that's also probably being very much wasted. And, and golf courses are getting better, farmers are getting better about using information and managing their water resources better. Um, where can this information come from? Well, let's get a monitor everywhere. Let's put a monitor on every well we can find. Let's, let's develop a co-op program to have people send us their data. Or let's monitor Twitter and see how many people are going out golfing today, right? Or see how many people, uh, I just mentioned to Antar, uh, people go out and eat dinner, right? And they take pictures of their food. And their diets change over time. And those, those changing diets change the food that's being produced because there's more people buying radishes. And that has a different water use. And that's, a, that's an interesting and challenging uh, avenue to research as far as water use into the future. So I'm just challenging you all to think of different ways. Imagine just brainstorm something that's completely ridiculous and say, how can I use that for science? And you'd be surprised what you can come up with. This interesting story, GPS, uh, GPS reflectometers in the western United States Plate Boundary Observatory uh, has these stations that just basically monitor plate movement. And this plate movement, uh, these big towers, uh, you know, they may, might be five meter towers, five meter posts, to tell you exactly where that plate position is in relation to the world and how it slowly moves a centimeter or two every year. Right? And they had this noise as a GPS satellite comes over. There's this little wiggle in the, in, the, in the reading. They said, well, what's that noise? Oh, we don't care. We just knock it out because we're worried about when it's over. We want an exact position. Our purpose is to know where this plate is. 
They noticed that wiggle was not the same from, year, from day to day. They found out that they're using L-band radiometry to know where that is. L-band is also used for soil moisture. And they found out that they were getting a bounce, and that told them what soil moisture was in the footprint of all of their plate boundary observatory systems. So that's an interesting side of now they had hundreds of stations measuring soil moisture that wasn't even intended. So think about that as you go forward.